Um, we are currently in a series that we're calling uh, Following Jesus, Discovering the Extraordinary Within the Ordinary. And what we're doing is we're taking a look at the story of Jesus, but with a little bit of a twist. Because what we're doing is we're looking at the story of Jesus through the eyes of the disciples. I mean, have you ever wanted, wondered or, or desired to just know, like, I, if I could rewind 2,000 years and walk with the disciples and walk with Jesus, I'm sure many of you have had that thought. And the goal is to see what in the world was it like to be following this Jesus around as he did his miraculous things and shocking things and ultimately amazing things with the cross and the resurrection. And so that's what we're doing in this series. Series. And what's really incredible is these disciples, they were ordinary folks. They were just like everyone else, yet Jesus called them and called them to do extraordinary things, and many of them would. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on this morning. And so, um, our, so today what we're going to be doing is peering in on this amazing moment that Peter has, where Peter comes to faith in Jesus in a way that he had not before. It's really a turning point in his story. It's really a highlight in the Gospels. And what we want to do is unpack that story today. And so the scripture reading this morning is Matthew 16, 13 through 20. And Marvin Barnes has graciously accepted the task of reading for us. And what we do here is we stand if you are able to, and we face the center of the room as the scriptures are read, and we do so because we believe that the scriptures are the center of our lives and truly the greatest story that's ever been told and has everything to do with us. So go ahead, Marvin. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my, but, my, but my, my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. You, Marvin, you may be seated. So, when is the last time you had that aha moment? That, that, that moment where suddenly the light bulb goes off and it all makes sense. You know what I'm talking about, right? There's those moments in, in our lives where we think we understand something or we're totally lost and suddenly it all makes sense. It's like the light bulb goes off. It's that aha moment and we suddenly get it. When was the last time you had one of those moments? You know, uh, we lived in Michigan b before we moved out to Idaho, and where we lived, we were just a couple hours outside of Chicago, and so we could drive there on weekends and days, and I love Chicago. It's a great place, but one of the things we loved the most about Chicago was the Christmas tree lighting ceremony. It was the best. There would be famous rock stars and speakers, and it was fabulous, and in one of these years, we wanted to be able to bring our kids but we wanted it to be a surprise. And the Christmas tree lighting was always on a Thursday. And so what we did is we decided to be really sneaky parents and then, you know, trick our kids into going to Chicago. And so what we did is they woke up on that Thursday morning. And when they woke up, they got dressed, they brushed their teeth, they ate breakfast, they grabbed their coats and their backpacks slung around, and then they got in the car and got ready for school. 
And what we thought was, as we drive, they're going to realize eventually that we're not headed to school. And so we get out of our driveway and we take a right instead of a left. Because if we took a left, we'd be going to their school. But we took a right and got under the freeway and then headed towards Chicago. And then I eagerly, because I get really excited about this kind of stuff, I eagerly am waiting for that moment where my kids realize, what in the world is going on? Where are we headed? And so we're driving. And 10 minutes pass, silence. And then 20 minutes pass, silence. And then 45 minutes pass, and still silence. And then at about the hour mark, we're about halfway to Chicago, my daughter speaks up and says, I don't remember getting to school being this long. <laughs> and she was lost. And then at that point, I couldn't take and I had to spill the beans. And I said, guys, you're not going to school today. We're going to Chicago for the Christmas tree lighting. And all three of them, it's like the light bulb went off and they all went, oh. <laughs> But we've all had moments like that. I know we have. And really this passage is about one of those aha moments. And it's really Peter's aha moment when he realizes for the first time who Jesus truly is. What, what I want to do is I want to back up, though, and kind of give you the backstory to make sense of what's going on here. And so if you kind of rewind in your Bible a little bit, we have Jesus, and Jesus has just finished performing a miraculous sign. Jesus has made a, just a couple fish and loaves of bread able to feed 4,000 people, and it's a big deal. And, and as they walk away from this experience, Jesus and his disciples Kind of these religious leaders, they walk up behind and they want to question Jesus. And they ask Jesus, so can you give us a sign? Can you give us a sign? And, and, and of course, Jesus had just given them an amazing sign. He fed 4,000 people with just about nothing. And, and there were leftovers. And Jesus maybe is a little bit frustrated. And this is how he responds to these leaders. He says, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. But none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. And if you know what the sign of Jonah is, the sign of Jonah is really like a slap to the face to these people. It's a, if you don't repent of your ways, God is going to destroy you. That's your sign. Are you happy with that? And then a couple more things happen. And the disciples at a point, they seem thoroughly confused as well. About as confused as the Pharisees. And Jesus says, you know what? What we're going to do is we're going to take a hike. We're going north. We're going to go to this place called Caesarea Philippi. And here, there's a map actually that will pop up. Up there in kind of red, you'll see Caesarea Philippi. It's almost at the top of the map. And then if you look right below that, there's almost like a little blue blob. That is the Sea of Galilee. And see, Jesus' ministry was almost exclusively in the Sea of Galilee region and all the towns and the cities surrounding. And th this whole region, the Sea of Galilee, was a very religious area. Good Jews did a lot of religious work there. They tried to follow the law perfectly, the best that they could. They were good Jews. But Jesus didn't go there. He said, let's leave Galilee. Let's go to Caesarea Philippi. Because Caesarea Philippi is different. Caesarea Philippi almost had a stigma back in the day. Because Caesarea Philippi was really the opposite of religious Judaism. It was paganism. It was the place where the gods of Rome were worshipped. There was no Judaism in sight. The Lord was certainly not worshipped in Caesarea Philippi. And it is here in this place that Jesus says, All right, let's chat. In a place of utter faithlessness, Jesus tests his disciples' faith. And his question was simple. Who, who do you think the Son of Man is? Who, who do you think the Son of Man is? Now, maybe to our ears that sounds strange, but to their ears, that made a lot of sense. Because Jewish people for a long time were waiting for the Son of Man figure to come. God was going to send this person, and this person was going to build an army, and this person was going to wipe out the Roman Empire and restore Israel to the way it was supposed to be. That's who the Son of Man is. And the disciples are truly clueless whenever Jesus asks this question. One of them pops up, and they're like, I don't know, John the Baptist? It could be him. Another pops up, well, maybe... 
maybe it's the prophet Elijah. That would, that would make sense. And another one's like, no, maybe it's, maybe it's Jeremiah. Or maybe it's just another prophet. We're really not sure. And then after this, Peter steps in. And here's what Peter says. Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. In a place of utter faithlessness, Caesarea Philippi, Peter declares the greatest faith. And and I think that must have been a powerful moment. You know those moments where you kind of get the shivers up and down your spine? Like, whoa, that was crazy. That was powerful. I think it was a moment like that. You see, this was the moment when all the pieces came together and Peter realized who Jesus truly was. Not John the Baptist, not one of the great prophets. No, Jesus, you're the Son of Man. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And and it's this little moment that I want to dive into this morning. Because this little moment might look a little bit like your little moments with God. So there's a couple things I'd like to just draw out of this. And the first is this. That in Peter's story, faith is a God event. Faith is a God event. The moment when it all clicks together for Peter and and then he realizes who Jesus is, that is a God event. And here's what I mean by this. Check out what Jesus says. He says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Did you get that? This, Peter, what you just said was not revealed to you by yourself, by your flesh and blood, by your body. No, it was revealed by my Father. Peter, you didn't discern this faith for yourself. God did. For some of us, that, make us, that might make us feel a bit uncomfortable. You know, we live in, in a culture... And this is no surprise to you, probably. But we live in a culture that's a pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps culture. It's a, I can do it myself. We take pride in doing things all on our own. We start businesses, and we raise our kids, and we build our retirements. And whatever we do, we want to do it all on our own. And when we do, we are proud that we did it alone. We didn't get help from anyone. But in this moment for Peter, Jesus says that faith, is one thing we can't do on our own. You know, we can do a lot with Christianity, like as a religion, can't we? We, we, can, we can study it, and, and we can read the Bible, and, and we can know every single story all the way through. We can even dive into the original languages, the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic, and we can read all of it and know all of those things. And it's good that we know them. We can read lots of really smart people that have written a lot about our faith. We can learn about theology and who God is and how sin works and and really who we are. And we can learn the historical arguments, right? We can learn the arguments that prove that, that Jesus had to have died historically on the cross and that something had to have happened on that next Sunday. We can do a lot of work and understand a lot of things, but it doesn't mean we have faith. Because faith only comes from God. Now you might be thinking, yeah, but then what's the role of the church if, if you know, God's kind of got this thing covered? What are we to do? See, the task of the church is to bring the good news of Jesus, right? It's to share our faith stories, right? It's to declare the gospel to the whole world, the good news of what Jesus did. But it is not us who brings faith. It is God who brings the faith. You know, some of us We consider ourselves seasoned Christians, right? 
We're seasoned saints. We, we love to study the scripture. We love the history and the complexity. Some of us love the Bible for the ethics that it gives us, right? It tells us what's right, and it tells us what's wrong. And some of us, we love just the daily guidance we can get from the Bible. But it is possible to love these things and still not have faith in Jesus. And there's others of us here this morning who we may be sitting here and we're like, I'm not sure I even buy into this whole Jesus thing. Some of us, perhaps, are sitting here and we're investigating. We're like, well, maybe I'm going to see if this works or not. I'm going to try this out. And there's others of us who are like, you know, I'm going to try this Christianity thing on and see if it works for me. I'm going to try to follow Jesus and see if it works for me. This morning, God is the giver of faith. And he is generous with all who ask. Perhaps this morning, God is asking you to ask for faith. There's another thing from Peter's aha moment. And it's this. F faith for Peter. It, it wasn't a one-time event, which is really interesting. Faith for Peter was a repeated experience. It happened over and over and over again. You see, this story is not the first time that Jesus or Peter meets Jesus and, you know, decides to follow him or not. If you remember, several weeks ago, we were going through the, the moment when Jesus calls his disciples, right? And then Peter's brother calls, calls Peter to come and kind of yanks him along and says, hey, I want you to meet this Jesus guy. And so, so Peter meets Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, I'm going to change your name. You're going to be one of my boys. And in that moment, Peter decides to follow Jesus. And, you know, in, in this day... You didn't just follow a rabbi and give up everything if you didn't believe him. You wouldn't do that. It was foolish. If you were skeptical of a rabbi, if you were skeptical of a teacher, you certainly weren't going to give up your whole life and follow this teacher. It just wouldn't be worth it. But Peter, Peter meets Jesus, and Jesus changes his identity, and Peter says, I'm following him. I'm following Jesus, and he gives up everything. And I think that takes faith. And so in our passage today, Peter was already a follower of Jesus. But suddenly God broke in and spoke to Peter and his faith came alive in a brand new way. It was a moment when it all clicked together and he realized something new. He realized who Jesus was in a way he just didn't before. Faith is a repeated experience. And in fact, for Peter, this wouldn't be his last experience. You know, near the end of Jesus' life, he's about to go to the cross, and he has a talk with, with Peter, and he says, hey, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, I would never deny you. I have way too much faith. He says, no, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, no, I'm not going to do that. And of course, Peter denies him three times. And it's interesting what Peter does when he realizes what he did. Check this out. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And what does Peter do? He went outside and he wept bitterly. It, it's a moment where Peter came to faith in a way he never had before. And, and this is true for us too. You know, our faith as followers of Jesus, whether you are on the front end or you have been going a long time, is full of conversion experiences where we just can't be the same after this happens. I had one of those moments. I was pursuing my master's degree and, and I was in class and I actually learned something in class which was new for me as I look back on this. Um, but I was in class I was taking a class on prayer and contemplation and self-knowledge, and it was kind of deep stuff. And part of the class was this moment where you had to break up into groups of fours. And so you break up into groups of fours, and you find a quiet place, and then you have to ask the rest of the group, the other three, a question. And the question was, how do you experience me? Now, that's a dangerous question, which I didn't realize at the time. How do you experience me? And so I, I kind of gave my experience of other folks, and then I waited, and I was kind of like, this is a dorky exercise. I don't really want to do this anymore. But then it got to me, and so I asked the question, how do you experience me? And I was not prepared for the responses. You know, one guy, he's a friend of mine, he said, you know, John, I experience you as closed off to intimacy. You don't let people 
in. And it was like a punch to the gut immediately. I was not prepared for that. And I was like, well, I might as well move on to the next guy, see what the next guy has to say. Maybe he's a little nicer. I don't know. And the next guy says, John, I experience you as unbelievably sarcastic. Ouch. And then we move on to the next guy. The next guy's got something better to say, right? John, I experience you as constantly on the defensive. I experience you as self-righteous. And it was at that moment, and I don't do this very often, guys, but it was in that moment I just started to cry. Have you had a moment like that? I just started to cry. Not because these guys are mean. I started to cry because what they said was true. What I had realized in that moment is that my pride was getting in the way of my relationships. And the thing that hurt the most was my pride was getting in the way of my relationship to God. And it crushed me. And when that class ended, I remember kind of like running away as fast as I could to the quietest, darkest place I could. And I sat there and I prayed a prayer like I never prayed before. And I was never the same after that moment. It, it, it was a conversion experience. You know, and though they aren't always heavy or they look, they don't always look the same way, but those experiences happen as we follow Jesus. We, we should expect conversion experiences no matter how far along the path we are. And you know, I think that, that if our lives are not marked by those aha moments along the way, we ought to pray for them. Because it's in those moments, whether it's through bitter tears like Peter, or whether it's through darkness or sadness or whatever it may be, we always walk out a different, changed person. And we can never go back. You know, when was your last conversion experience? When was that moment last where the light bulb went off and you understood Jesus and your relationship to him in a whole new way. Have you even had one of those yet? One more point. Faith in this story is a powerful catalyst. It's a powerful catalyst. You know, a Christ follower who is full of faith has unbelievable power and you're thinking, I don't think so. Really, it's true. Listen to what Jesus says of Peter's faith. He says, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And there's really two things going on here. First, declaring our faith makes the church unstoppable. It makes the church unstoppable. Jesus tells Peter that his faith is the thing that even Hades can't come across. Nothing can overcome this faith. In other words, when the church is filled with faith, nothing on earth can defeat it. The light will always overcome the darkness if we are people of faith. Peter would spend the rest of his life pouring out his faith wherever he went, and the church would explode with growth. You know, in fact, church history shows that Peter would eventually die, and he would die on a crucifix just like Jesus, just like his rabbi, except he would do it upside down because he didn't want to be just like Jesus. And when he died, many, many people were saved. It was like his faith was poured out upon Rome. And generations later, Christianity grew so quickly that Rome was swept away with the Christian faith. And people were following Jesus all through the Roman Empire. It is a powerful thing when a church has great faith. And it is powerful for us as well. Imagine if TFRC had a faith like Peter's. What would this Magic Valley, what would your city, what would your neighborhood look like? Would it change? I think it would. The kingdom of God would be unstoppable. One more. Declaring our faith binds and looses according to Jesus. Jesus tells Peter that the keys of the kingdom will be given to him and he will have the power to bind and to loose. And, and if you're not sure what that means, it's okay because it meant something in this time. 
Jewish leaders of the day could bind and loose actions. They could bind and loose what you do. If they were afraid that you might break the law, they would say, I bind that, you can't do that anymore. And if they're like, you're not going to break the, the law if you do this, I will loose it, and, and you can go ahead and do it. And Jesus says that the church, with great faith, can do the same thing. And the disciples do in the book of Acts. Suddenly in the book of Acts, meat that was sacrificed to an idol, which was a huge no-no to the Jews, you don't do that, could be eaten if you had a clear conscience. And perhaps the most shocking is that Gentiles, outsiders, non-Jewish people, didn't have to become Jewish to enter the church anymore. It was totally shocking for the day. The church loosed, binding and loosing. See, when the church is full of faith, when we are full of faith, it can navigate life and we can go through difficult situations and we can do it with confidence because our faith is guiding us and it will be reflected in heaven. It's great power. So the question for each of us this morning, do we have a faith like Peter's? Do we have a faith like Peter's? Do we have a faith where we're willing to just go all in at any cost because we believe, we believe, we believe, and it changes the world? Do we have that still? I'm not saying we can't fail and falter and doubt and, and be confused, but do we have a faith to declare? And if not, what would it look like for you to have that? And what would it look like for you to declare that faith if you do? You know, each week we've given you a couple challenges to go through. And here's this week's challenge. This week's challenge one, pray for a heart to declare the good news, to declare your faith. Pray for it. And two, pray for an opportunity to declare the good news. Pray for an opportunity to share your faith. And when that opportunity comes, take it. Share it. Share it. Let's pray.